Um, thank you everyone for showing up to Columbia Science Review's first virtual event on Zoom. Um, this event will uh, revolve very broadly on public health in prisons when this obviously has a lot of uh, timely significance because of the coronavirus pandemic that is currently impacting everyone, but uh, I would say disproportionately those who are um, in our correctional system. So we have two um, great speakers with us today. We have Dr. Bob Fololove, who is a professor of sociomedical sciences and the associate dean of community and minority affairs at Mailman. And he's also the senior advisor for public health for the Bard Prison Initiative in New York. And we also have Dr. Mark Stern, who is a professor of public health at the University of Washington and the University of Albany. And uh, he's also a consultant in correctional health care. Uh, so I'll just give a brief rundown on how this event will go. Um, it's our first online event, so bear with us for any technical difficulties that may arise. But uh, this will be a panel style, so I will ask uh, our speakers questions. And if any of you audience members have questions that you think of along the way, feel free to uh, type it into the chat box and it'll get sent directly to me. And after I'm done with my questions, I'll start reading your questions out. Uh, so yeah, I think that's it for me. And we'll start now. Uh, let's just start with uh, introductions. I know I gave a brief overview, but if you could talk a little more about what you do, uh, what you research and where, that'd be great. Uh, Dr. Folov. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I am in my uh, 31st year as a member of the faculty of the Columbia University Medical Center. Since the 1990s, I have been very much engaged with HIV research. And one of the first avenues of inquiry that I pursued had to do with the intersection between communities, the correctional system, and the problems that we were experiencing with HIV AIDS. Uh, to this day, one of the heaviest pools of HIV infection is in prison. And I have been writing about this and worried about the degree to which our failure to contain HIV in communities was in large measure because of our failure to do very much about it in incarceration settings. From that, because I've talked about it, because I've been associated with a lot of publications that have dealt with this issue, 10 years ago, I started teaching at the Bard Prison Initiative. As you noted in the introduction, I teach courses in public health. I'm an advisor to the public health programs that are run in the prison, as well as the programs that alumna and alumni from the Bard Prison Initiative are running in the communities to which they return. I've had three of the students that I taught in prison graduate from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health with master's degrees in mental health. Three of these folks currently work for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And it's part of an effort that I continue to engage in to try and do what I can to have people in public health pay attention to the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of wisdom, and the wealth of talent that resides in many of our systems of incarceration. I've discovered that when people come back home, alerted to what happens to their communities with respect to public health, they become some of the greatest advocates for public health programs you could imagine. So that's the orientation that I bring to the issues that we'll be discussing tonight. And uh, it's something that I, you know, will be continuing to do, I think, uh, even from the confines of this apartment. Dr. Stern. Um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you guys a lot earlier out here than it is. I'm on the West Coast in Olympia, Washington. Um, I'm an internist um, and a correctional physician. I was in the VA for a number of years and totally by accident, which most people um, of my generation find themselves in corrections totally by accident. I got a call from the Commissioner of Health in Albany County one day that they had fired the doctor at the jail and said, uh, Mark, could you come in and cover for the weekend? And I said one of the dumbest things I think I've ever said, which is, 
you have doctors in jails? Really? <laughs> and three days became three weeks, became three months, and became um, the, the rest of my career for the last uh, 20 years or so. So I moved from the Albany County Health Department, uh, Department of Corrections, to the uh, New York State Department of Corrections. I was a regional medical director in the Albany area and um, found out that uh, Dr. Fulov and I have have a couple of facilities in common that we both know and um, and then had an opportunity to really set up uh, the correctional health care system in the state of Washington. So I got on the Major Deegan, took a left at Albany, uh, took a throughway as far I, as I could go and when I hit water I took a left turn and I was in, in um, Olympia, Washington and spent the next few years developing the health care system here in Washington until about 2008 when I left. Um, I continue to do only correctional health care, both in locally in Washington state around the country and um, a little bit in uh, abroad, uh, Haiti, um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, do some courses in Namibia. And my goal in all this work is to improve patient safety in our correctional environments. Um, I do, a, I do at this point a lot of work aside from uh, teaching at the two places that you, you mentioned and doing some research. Um, I do a lot of work mostly with government agencies. So it may be jails or prisons and maybe state agencies. Uh, I've worked a lot with Homeland Security in their Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, looking at the quality of care in immigration detention, but also doing that for federal courts elsewhere. And I think I wanna, um, one of the things that Bob just said that really resonates is about the impact of what happens in our correctional institutions on our communities. And I think when, when we come back to talking a little bit more about COVID-19, I think it's, it is the perfect example of, of why that's true and, and why it's important for us to look at what happens inside for the public, uh, the safety of the public. So I'll take a break there and give it back to you, Ham. You're mute. I'm sorry. Um, so I guess the the timeliness aspect of this lies in the coronavirus pandemic. And so I was wondering if you could just give a brief overview or not, maybe not brief, but an overview of what's happening in, in prisons uh, with the people in them, uh, the people connected to them um, and what's happening inside as conditions have worsened? Uh, uh, Bob or me? Either, sorry, this is really awkward to do online, but either <laughs> you can take it or both. Want me to go first? Sure. Okay, um, that's fine. It's, we're um, at, at eight o'clock at night, we gotta be informal. <laughs> so um, yeah, I have the, the coronavirus has sucked the air out of out of, um, out of the room for the last few weeks. I've been heavily involved in it in a, in three capacities. One is with uh, litigation, so a lot of um, advocacy groups, ACLU and others, and actually I'll come back to that moment. Uh, the the government side, in other words, the defense side, have asked for declarations in cases that are ongoing. They've, they've mushroomed in the last uh, two, three weeks. The second thing is a lot of work with the media. You get a lot of questions um, about what's going on in specific places and, and generally around the country. And then my third role has been for the local Washington State Sheriff's Association and also for the National Sheriff's Association. Uh, they asked me to be their uh, corona expert because obviously the sheriff's associations deal with all the jails around the country. So it's, uh, it's been pretty busy. And how I'll sum up the public health issue, I'll sum up the public health issue because it comes up in, in each of those conversations. Um, jails and prisons and detention centers, and I may just say one of those words, but I mean all three of them, are congregate environments. And uh, a, a colorful way to think of them is as landlocked cruise ships. When you say that, everybody kind of gets the picture. But they're worse than, than landlocked cruise ships in the sense that land, when you're on a cruise ship, everything that happens, unless somebody jumps overboard, it stays on the cruise ship. Whereas with prisons and jails, people are coming and going, officers and staff, and vendors. Um, and as a congregate environment, we know from public health standpoint that viruses, any infection that's spread by, by touch or by air is gonna spread 
more easily. Regardless of all the steps you may put into place like social distancing, we still have a, at the core a basal risk, which is because we have a congregate environment. And so there is a risk to the public health because of the people who are there. Unfortunately, what's happened is that a lot of the, the governors and, and judges and others who look at this issue in the last few weeks have kind of narrowed, not na I, I don't want to be um, pejorative, but they, they only see the risk as being to the people who are currently incarcerated. And that's not at all unimportant. We have two and a half million people who are incarcerated, they're important. But the public health implications of, of COVID-19 go beyond the people who are in, incarcerated. And it happens in two ways. The first way is, as I mentioned a moment ago, that these are not closed boxes. They're not cruise ships and staff come and go and the staff are at risk for, for getting infected as well as the people who are incarcerated, the residents. And so when they go home every day, if, if they catch something, they're at risk for taking it home to their family and friends. And therefore there's a public health risk to the community by that infection in, in, the, in the correctional institution. The second risk to the public health comes across when you look at the high risk, high medical risk people who are incarcerated, the people who are elderly over, and elderly in jail and prison is, I'm gonna say is over 50, not over 65, because people in jail and prison age more quickly in, in a number of ways. Um, and people who have underlying health diseases, and I, you guys have all heard about that. So imagine these people are, are incarcerated, um, there's a higher chance that they're going to get the disease because they're in this congregate environment. And then when they do, we know that they're more likely to get really sick. Really sick means um, getting pneumonia, getting sepsis, going to the hospital, potentially being in the intensive care unit and going on a ventilator. So when they do that, there's one or two prison hospitals around the country, but otherwise they're going to our community hospitals. And whether it's a federal detention center, a state or, or a jail, they're going to the local hospital in that community. And they're going to be in a bed that is a very scarce resource. And so that's the second way in which COVID-19 is has a very important public health effect. And so what should we do? What do we need to do? What are people doing to address the, the risk? And it, it falls into two buckets. The first bucket is that we need to do everything we can to follow CDC guidelines for reducing the risk of spread. And this is all the things you're see, hearing about and seeing about, um, redu uh, increasing the space, wearing masks, washing your hands, all that other stuff. But that, those things can be, and, and Bob may come back to it, um, very difficult to do in, in a prison environment. Uh, not only just because of the physical layout, but because um, not every per, every resident in a detention center gets enough soap to do that. They have to buy their soap very often. Uh, they don't get paper towels. Um, the, they may not have doors separating them from others. They may have bars, in which case air can travel more easily. So just doing the things the CDC recommends that by itself can be very difficult, if not impossible. Um, the second thing we need to be doing is decreasing, downsizing the size of the institutions. Because the fewer people that are there, the more you can spread out. A four person cell is more, you're more likely to spread something than a two person or a one person cell. Uh, when it's time to eat, if, if people, residents can come out of their cell and eat one person to a table instead of four people to a table, there's less likely to, to spread infection. So it's really important in addition to doing the, the preventive things to also be downsizing. But that's a really, really difficult thing to do because we have some people um, who are in prison for because they're they're dangerous to society. Um, letting some people out is really easy. You know, an 85-year-old man with you know, heart disease and lung disease who committed a minor offense that didn't hurt anybody. Um, that's easy. That that person doesn't present a major risk. And at the other extreme, the person who's a multi felony has committed multi felonies that have killed people. Most of us probably don't want that person released immediately. But there are a lot of people in between. And if we only look at the risk um, in terms of violence, we're not looking at the whole risk. The whole risk to the public right now is a combination of, of criminal factors, uh, criminal justice factors, but it's also 
public health factors. And, and the system has never had to think that way before. They've never had to think, you know, maybe this person might be a little bit violent, might recommit the crime, which would be horrible, but at the same time, keeping them in prison could also pose a risk to the public. And so our, um, our courts and our, our corrections departments are, are faced with this incredibly difficult decision, but important one to try to downsize right now. So I think I'll take a breath there and turn it back to you. Uh, Dr. Fola? Sure. <clears throat> that was <clears throat> very, very comprehensive. <clears throat> and I think, it, excuse me, I think it really does cover all the key issues. I, I think the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that in the vast majority of the cases, the persons who are inside were not basically tried and convicted to such a degree that they were given a death sentence. We're not talking about folks on death row. So what we worry about most is someone contracting this virus and dying as a result of it, literally because we couldn't figure out how to get them out of harm's way. It's almost as if we are essentially sentencing them without a court to a death sentence. So we worry about that most, not just because of the public health danger and certainly not just because of the human rights that we have struggled to maintain, which are gonna be stomped upon if something like this happens. It's because the entire system, as Mark has pointed out, is so unable to handle something like this. Folk are afraid of setting precedents with whatever they do. Larry Brown, who is one of the professors here at the Mailman School of Public Health, once said, once you give something to the public, you can't take it back. All the things that are being done, not just about prisoners in prisons, but incarcerated people who are in jails, often represents things that have us saying, you know, that's really not that important. We don't have to do that. There are dozens of things between the police, the prosecutors, the folk who administer prisons, there are all things that they've decided, okay, in this kind of crisis, we don't have to do this. <clears throat> For example, if somebody has been told by the parole board, you can go home, their date is four weeks ahead. Well, why not let that person go now? What purpose is served by keeping that individual there for another four weeks? Especially as Mark has pointed out, their being there is putting them at risk, not putting them at risk, the prison staff at risk, the general public at risk. If it's the case that much of what we're doing isn't because of the high number of people who are dying, it's definitely part of it, but literally because of the fear we have of how it's overloading our healthcare system, then at some levels it becomes less about who's in the bed. It's really a question of there aren't enough beds, so what can we do to make sure that we prevent a situation where somebody winds up being exposed to this bug, winds up getting sick, winds up going to the hospital, when we could have prevented it. There are so many decisions like that that are per currently a part of the debate. What should we do about incarcerated populations in the face of this epidemic? Where number one, there's the question of who's got the nerve to do it. What politician can withstand the pressure if it seems to the general public that they're soft on crime? Then there's the, not only are we concerned about, you know, what are we gonna do with the folk who are on the inside, what changes are we making in the system to accommodate this virus that we won't be able to reverse at the moment that the all clear sound has sounded and we go back to normal. So think of this as an issue in public policy that has all kinds of dangers brought with it. See this as a major public health crisis because this is one of the most confined populations that we have, even worse than a nursing home. This is a place that could be a real, real serious tragedy in the making. And think of this in terms of uh, politics in the United States at this point in 2020, where once again, when the all clear is sounded, we're gonna look at mortality rates in black communities in particular, that are gonna include every, manage, every manner of social disadvantage you can think of, from chronic diseases and the high rate of prevalence that exists in the black population, to all the folk who are endangered because of the degree to which they are in the criminal justice system. If you start looking at mortality across all of these different population categories in our very complex social system, and if you see that in each one of these boxes, there's a higher rate of mortality amongst African-Americans, I think the real tragedy with this pandemic won't just be the people who've lost their lives, it'll be all of the horrible recriminations that are gonna happen after the fact 
when folks are not only going to say something terrible happened, they're also going to say, you know, you could have prevented this. It's one of the things that, I makes, that, that makes a forum like this, it seems to me, so critical because there's so many issues that have to be confronted here. And let me stop here. There's um, something you said, Bob, is um, it's really an important underpinning of this whole issue, which is all that I, we've been talking about, well, not then, Bob, you brought up, um, assumes that, that we have had, we started three months ago with a highly functional healthcare system within jails and prisons. <laughs> and that ain't true. Um, we, had, we started with a system that was already broken in a lot of places. There's some places that are doing a decent job, but largely broken. Healthcare is not a priority for the U.S., uh, for, for us as a country in, health, in corrections, in jails and prisons. So a lot of jails and prisons are already, were already um, hamstrung in delivering basic medical care and now graft COVID-19 on, on top of it, and it really makes it difficult to take care of the people. I think you both touched on this debate that's happening, like so many decisions at so many nexuses of public policy, of public health that need to be decided and made. But, you know, it just seems like a lot of these lives are in limbo right now. So what has to be done, I guess? I, I would say that uh, <clears throat> we are really anticipating, I, I know Mark is in this crew, a news story that is bound to come out where all of a sudden you're just going to see that there are not only high rates of infection, but high rates of mortality amongst incarcerated persons and the staff. And there's going to be a lot of hand wringing. I, I think uh, we're a nation that does better with postmortems than we do with prevention initiatives. And, and I really worry that that's going to change this conversation dramatically. I, I just know that. Um, what Mark said that is so true, if you talk to people in probation, for example, your average probation officer in New York City is terrified to death that someone under his or her charge is going to commit a crime that's going to make front page headlines and completely ruin them and the department that they work for. So there is a sense in which, as a nation, we never forgive people for having been convicted of a crime. And it's really the case that we don't believe that they have the same rights as everyone else. So that means it's very difficult for politicians or people who work in the system to act on behalf of the incarcerated. It's not a popular position to take. Uh, a lot of our entertainment is about cops and robbers, about crime and punishment. So we have a culture that really has us in the poorest position imaginable to act authoritatively and decisively about caring for a population like this. <clears throat> I believe that the United States is a place where we're only motivated to do the right thing when a tragedy occurs. And I'm afraid that all of our pressure to have governors and uh, superintendents of corrections do the right thing about moving expeditiously to put everyone who is in their care in a safe position. I, I believe that all the issues we're trying to raise, all the pressure that we're trying to bring to bear will be for nothing until there is a major tragedy, a public outcry, uh, newspaper headlines, utterances of, oh my God, this is horrible. Why didn't somebody do something? And then, and then people will start to act decisively. Um, <clears throat> you just get punished for preventing an event from happening. Um, swine flu in 2009, 2010, Public health folk tried to say swine flu is going to have the same kind of impact that COVID-19 uh, is having today. It did not. <clears throat> and it's made everybody wary of public health modelers who say something terrible is coming. So we're just not conditioned to act decisively. We're just not conditioned to pay attention to predictions that are really telling us that something terrible is happening. We seem to be a nation that only does well when the tragedy has occurred and then we say, oh my God, I guess we have to do something. And what I worry about, again, is that at a time when we should be acting decisively, we're waiting for that tragedy to occur, because only then will we be motivated to do the right thing. Mark, you might have a different take, but I, I'm, a, I'm a pessimist when it comes to this. I really worry that we're waiting for the bad thing before we do the right thing. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. I agree with you 100%. I, uh, every time I talk to one of the attorneys working on the case this, the past couple of weeks, I'm, I'm done with my, my spiel, and I say, I 
I think I must have depressed you because I know I've depressed myself in this conversation. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's, I, I, I hear the responses that are com coming back from departments of corrections and governors um, in these cases. And it's exactly what you said. I understandably, they're worried about the, the person who gets out and commits a crime and somebody says, why did you let that person out? And um, I th and Hannah, in answer to your question, I think our responsibility is to, for all of us to echo the things that Bob and I are saying. And unfortunately, since, I hate to say it out loud, but since the lives of the people who are behind bars may not be important as to, important to everybody as they should be, maybe the political thing to do is to accentuate the risks not only to them but to the rest of the public to say okay these people are important but if they're not important to you then at least the staff who work in the facilities and the people at the hospitals that they people are going to go to those people must be important to you so let's act um, i think that's all we can do but ultimately i think bob is right it's going to take a few disasters before people um, start to say hmm maybe they were right and we do need to uh, let more people out and we need to provide more preventive steps within the jails and prisons. Um, my next question talks a little bit about um, access to healthcare, not necessarily right now, even before um, access to healthcare, but not only that, health education in prisons. Um, you know, now I think I can personally say that I'm bombarded with uh, COVID-19 information everywhere I turn, but what's, what about in prisons and jails? Are they getting information? Bob? Huh? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> first, it's often difficult to wrap one's head around the fact that there are 50 states in the United States. Prisons aren't monolithic institutions. Every state has a different organization of its Department of Corrections. Every state has a different way of dealing with jails at the municipal as well as the county level. Although we know that what we're talking about is people behind bars, it's really basically at that point that all the similarities disappear. So it's hard to say what folk are getting in general because what you really wanna ask is in this situation, in this state, in this facility, how are, how are things going? I know that in New York State, there is a tremendous amount of variation about what people are being told and what's happening. Uh, most of the facilities are on lockdown. People are being told very decisively that they're in the midst of a crisis. The folk that I had in my public health classes at the Bard Prison Initiative were more aware than most of what this was basically going to become. By the beginning of March, they had already figured out as public health students what was likely to happen. And they had been talking to a lot of the folk on the inside about, we've got to take care of ourselves, even if it's not clear that the folk who are running the joint are going to be as careful or as considerate of us as we are with each other. And I think that's probably true everywhere. Folks do have access to the media. Folks do have access to sources of news and information. So to the degree that the media have basically kept this headline news. It's the only thing anybody talks about. I think they're aware. The problem is that in many instances, that's almost led them to the point of panic because they know what could be done. They know what should be done. And when it's not happening, they're not stupid. They're really aware of the fact that there is something going on here, which is why so many advocates are doing their best to try and give voices to the folk on the inside, are trying to put as much pressure on possible, uh, on, uh, as much pressure as possible on the decision makers at whatever level so that they'll do something dramatic. And they are using the information that they have to argue rather eloquently for better treatment, for better consideration when all of the uh, efforts are being made to keep people safe. How safe they are varies depending on the facility. There are already many throughout the United States that are reporting high rates of infection amongst staff as well as amongst the incarcerated population. But there are plenty of places where folks aren't even testing. So we really don't know how bad things are. Um, it's a way of saying that it's a complex situation. It's hard to describe on average what's happening. I would say that there are bright spots. There are places that are tragedies waiting to happen. And there's a whole bunch in the middle where we just don't know. But I do think that where you don't see decisive action being taken, 
by decision makers. We're dealing with a real powder powder uh, powder keg, excuse me, that I think is really going to, once again, really be the stuff of some tragic headlines if we're not really, really careful in what it is we try to do to prevent tragedies from happening. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think it's actually uh, your crystal ball works really well. Um, because we here in Washington State, in our largest penitentiary, we've already had an uprising. Um, fortunately, no one was hurt. It was rather minor uh, as things go. But it was for all the reasons that Bob just said. Um, they're not stupid people. Um, but they're scared. I mean, we're all scared. And imagine that you're scared and you have very little control over your life. You're, you, 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 have, you're, you can't get soap easily if you don't, if, you know, unless somebody gives it to you. You can't take a shower unless somebody gives it to you. And you can't walk outdoors. You can't get away from another person unless somebody lets you get away from that person. Um, it makes people really scared. And I, I, I found that people in prison are, are awfully resilient to a limit, <laughs> as, you know, as, as any of us would be. Um, they want to be safe. They want to get out in one piece and go back to their lives. They don't, they don't want to, most prisoners don't want to, uh, people in prison don't want to hurt people. They don't want to be hurt. They want to do their time and get out and, and go back to society. Um, but when you don't get enough information, it makes you nervous. And like I said, I, we've already seen that about three, four days ago, I think it was here in Washington, that there was uh, about 100 people just, um, it, was a, it was a mini riot. Again, it could have been a lot worse, but it probably um, may very well have stemmed from just not enough information. And <laughs> I, I, I really uh, want to underscore something else you said, Bob, about testing. Um, I guess it makes me laugh a little bit when, when one of the, somebody will come back in a case and say, well, we don't have a problem. We don't have any cases. And it's like, do you not have cases or do, do you not know you have cases? Um, or you don't, you either don't, you, you have cases, you either don't know you have cases or you don't have cases yet, but we just expect you will. So Hannah, your, your, your question is really important and the educational piece is, is important. Um, I want to just seg segue for one second to something, Anna, that I mentioned, I told you I might mention today, um, which is about communication between p residents in the facilities and their families. Um, so I was you know, on one of my conference calls with my own colleagues around the country who, who are involved in correctional health care. And somebody said at one of their facilities, somebody had been listening to the phone calls. As you guys know, uh, people are allowed to make phone calls, but those phone calls, unless they're with a, an attorney, they're not privileged. And, um, and people know that. They know that their, their phone calls are being recorded. And somebody was listening to some of those phone calls and discovered um, a couple of people talking about with somebody who's talking to his wife at home and mentioned that he has symptoms of COVID-19 and um, isn't telling anybody about them. And this happened uh, about three, four days ago, and it was really um, Monday, Monday afternoon. And it was, first of all, quite scary to me because we don't, we know sometimes people, um, everybody, not just people in prison, exaggerate about their symptoms. And that's okay. You exaggerate, you'll go be seen, you'll be seen by somebody and they'll say, don't worry about it, you're okay. But the opposite right now is very worrisome. If you have symptoms, we want people, we're telling people, we're educating people that you should go and tell the officer and tell a nurse that you're sick so you can be examined and if necessary, quarantined or, or isolated. And if there are people who are not sharing that information, that's really bad. So it turns out there's a company that um, has software that can actually analyze keywords. And uh, through the National Sheriff's Association, we're going to, in the next few days, hopefully, get a band of people together and um, sign in to, into the cloud to, to the software package and, and listen to some of these conversations and see if we can pinpoint the reasons for this. And obviously the purpose of that is if we can understand the reasons, then maybe we can intervene. For example, what are the, uh, one of the reasons that people may not be volunteering the information is you may, when you say I have symptoms and I have a cough, let's say, what do you think they're gonna do with you? They're probably gonna stick you in um, isolation or quarantine. Now that sounds okay if you're at home, you know, I'm at home right now, <laughs> I've got my refrigerator, I've got you know, my dogs, I'm pretty comfortable. Um, I don't, but I could be in quarantine and I, I would do fine. But quarantine in a prison in a lot of places means they're sticking them in cells that are ordinarily used for what we call segregation or solitary confinement. 
And they may be taking away things that you know, take away your television, take away your reading material, the other things that, that make life bearable in a cell. Um, and that could be, I don't know, that's one of the things we want to find out, the reason that people are not declaring that they have symptoms. So um, one of the things that we, I mean, we may do in the next couple of days is reach out to people like your own group and see if through Columbia University, um, students are interested in helping out, I guess it's a really form of crowdsourcing, of um, dipping into these uh, phone calls and seeing if we can find the reasons and then communicate that back to the jails and prisons and hopefully remediate whatever the problem is so that we can get people treated and do whatever we can to avert um, the, the disaster that, that Bob and I think is coming. So I guess I'm just saying if uh, we're gonna do this a little bit more organized, but if uh, the folks who are, who've attended today, if you have an interest in doing some of that, and it, I don't know how much, how much time it's going to take though I, I suppose you could probably do just as much as you have time for if it's let's say you know a couple of hours um, that may be enough uh, but we're going to look to to get some students around the country who are interested in this and see if we can get an answer to the question so anyhow I'll, I'll take a breath there yeah I think um, that's definitely something that students would be interested in and to add on to that for people who are listening right now, who um, want to make an impact in this area, who want to do something about it, do you have any other suggestions or opportunities to, to suggest to these people? Um. Well, <clears throat> I think what we essentially have had is the pressure that comes from lobbying and from protest. Uh, right now, you can't get people in the streets you can't have the old fashioned protest demonstration, but everyone is on Zoom. Everyone is using the media to send messages. I understand that uh, all the telephone companies are just like dying because of the volume of traffic that they have. The good news is that people have to pay attention to that. And when it becomes clear in an election year that people are carefully noting all the things that people are and aren't doing. There are so many things in the state of New York and in the city of New York where people have been rallying to protest online and in a variety of other uh, uh, crowdsourcing type uh, fora. They were really saying, look, we've got to have people do something. And we're reminding all the folk who are decision makers, we're watching what you do. We're waiting for you to do the right thing. Uh, just be aware that public awareness of the importance of your act the importance of your actions is definitely there. People know what's going on. I do the right thing. Uh, because we do have the sense that in a couple of states, people have responded to that pressure. Since that's what I think is available to us, it's one of the things I'd urge people to do. The other thing is that uh, stay informed. Um, there is so much going on. Uh, again, because we're talking about 50 different states, dozens if not hundreds of different municipalities that have prison settings. There's so much going on, it's hard to really come up with a description nationally of what's happening where you have a, a sense of what's the average event, what's the average amount of um, situational problems that people are confronting. It, it varies depending on where you are. So that means that the more people are staying in touch communicating and helping everybody sift through all this information to make sense of it, the greater will be the sense that we all have that our efforts to protest and our efforts to call attention to the dire straits that these folk are in will have ultimately succeeded. This is 60s style protest brought into the 21st century where you're not only making yourself seen and making yourself heard, you're also trying to do your best to understand what's going on and then react to situations as they change. Things are very fluid. So um, what is true this week is probably gonna change next week. And the more people are on top of this and the more they're able to react and bring po protest where it's necessary, I think the better off we'll, we'll all ultimately be. It is the best that I have at the moment because <clears throat> I just don't know how physically we can do very much more than uh, make our presence known. I, I would echo that. I think I think that is the answer. And specifically, so the who and the what. Um, I think the the who right now 
jails are doing a, generally a better job, but it's easier to get people out of jails, uh, at least in terms of downsizing jails, because remember, most of those people are pretrial and it's discretionary on the part of the judge and the, and the prosecutor whether they remain in jail or let out on bail or no bail. Prisons are a lot tougher because you're there with a sentence and uh, it, 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 it's not discretionary anymore. But once you're in prison, it mostly falls on the, uh, the governor, legislature, legislator, or in this, mostly in this case, governors, to, um, to make emergency rules that would let people out. So I would say two things. Um, you know, you guys live in New York, and I think, and Bob, I don't know, I'm, my impression is that, that New York City is doing a little bit better job with Rikers Island and elsewhere of emptying out. Um, so if you guys are from other communities around the country, you may want to check in with the jails in your community and find out what, just roughly what percentage of the population has been left out. Right here in Olympia, Washington, I know that my jail population has gone, I found out, has gone down by um, over 30%, probably close to 40%. That's really pretty good. Is it enough? I don't know, but it's, it's better than 2% or 5%. So, so find out if your hometown jail, whether they made some significant progress in downsizing. And then the second thing is at the state level and the person there is the governor. Um, right now it's the governors who can make that proclamations, emergency proclamations to say, let people out, not willy nilly. Um, and so that's the who, the what, is, the what is asking them to downsize, not just again, willy nilly, not everybody, because then you sound like a nut, because <laughs> um, they're not going to let everybody out. Um, but let people out after a calculus of what's the public health risk, along with what's the what's the um, public safety risk. Um, and and as Bob was saying earlier, if they understand from you that you're watching them, and if somebody doesn't get out and they die, and their crime was a relatively minor one, well, that's on the governor or the legislature or you know the the county commissioner, whatever it is. Uh, and you've warned them, and that public pressure is important. And, and I want to <clears throat> just add something about jails, because that is a very important distinction. <clears throat> Remember I said earlier that what we're looking at is decision-making all up and down the system. So the decision on the part of the police, do I really need to arrest this person? Mm -hmm. There are a whole bunch of petty crimes. In New York City, I'm thinking about people who are smoking a joint. I, there's, no reason, there's no reason to send somebody to Rikers for that. <clears throat> the end of the world will not happen as a result of somebody token up. <clears throat> Everything about uh, what prosecutors decide to do. Do we hold this person or not? Do we bring this person to pre-trial detention or not? I mean, there are so many decisions that are being made where if you do the right thing, you don't have the creation of a congregate uh, problem. You're really not gonna have a, an issue with too much in the way of crowding. The more you make decisions like that, the more careful we are about what we decide really must be done. Um, the more we decide that some things that don't need to be done will result in us keeping people safe, the more we see that kind of thinking enter into decision-making at all levels, I think the better off the system itself is going to be. And <clears throat> because that decision-making at the level of the jail, literally from the arrest to whether or not we're going to hold somebody to trial, those are the points that Mark correctly pointed out where it's easy to make adjustments, where it's e easy to say, yeah, we're not going to do that. And as a result of not doing that, you've lessened the likelihood that you're going to have a problem with crowding. Prisons is another thing altogether. It's all about space. Where are we going to, if we're going to take people out of the facilities, where are we going to place them if we're not going to put them back in the community? And watchdogging that, being careful about making sure that when people say they're going to do something, that they actually do it. Once again, I think this is the role of public opinion. And I think in COVID-19, I've seen a lot more of this and I've seen it be a lot more effective than I think has been the case before this tragedy befell us. So I'm, I'm thinking we've got to just keep it up. There are so many folk who signed on to this because they're interested in what's going on. So that interest in monitoring what's going on, I think can ultimately lead to people putting pressure where it needs to be put to make sure that we do the right thing in the face of this tragedy. And I just have one last question. You mentioned um, making sure we know where we're putting these people after they're released because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but access to health care um, in the U.S. correctional system is a constitutional right? Yes, yes. that's right. Yeah. Um, so what are the challenges that face people who are released and potentially don't have that medical care anymore? 
Listen, we've had those problems since way before COVID-19. <clears throat> Housing is a major issue. In too many states, depending on the nature of your conviction, you simply can't get housing. You can't get federal housing from Section 8. There are many federal housing projects where you're not going to be allowed to enter. So much of the homeless problem here in New York and in other major urban centers is fed by our inability to really care for folk once they've been released from jail or from prison. So yeah, one of the big issues about where you put them is we've got a big homeless problem that predates COVID-19 that literally arose because there isn't enough housing for everybody, not just for the folk who are formerly incarcerated, but for that population, it's particularly extreme because there are so many barriers to them to their finding out, uh, for their finding some place that will allow them to rent or to buy. Uh, I think the other thing has to do with, yes, depending on the state, the ability of corrections to connect to the social services that are available in a given community, that's not always a smooth connection. That transition doesn't always work the way it's supposed to. But now that we're nilly, willy nilly, just sort of saying, you can go, we're gonna put you back in the community. I think that problem has become more extreme. Um, it is true that in some settings I have heard that if you don't have health insurance, you may have a real issue getting tested and getting a variety of things that are gonna be necessary to ensure that you're okay. Well, that problem is gonna be manufactured for folk who've suddenly been released, who don't have the appropriate paperwork, who don't have the ID necessary, and who can't qualify for a lot of services because the paperwork hasn't followed them. It's not clear that in all the rush decisions that we're making, that we've done enough to make sure that there's a coordinated access to services and healthcare so that when folks do get out, they stand a good chance of being okay. Uh, <clears throat> and again, because, <clears throat> because we were so unprepared for this crisis, because we just had no idea that this was coming, uh, we're really caught short. And what you're seeing is what happens when people are engaged in crisis management. And in the midst of crisis management, a lot of stuff just simply doesn't work. And I'm really, really concerned that that's the situation that we're facing now. I, um, you only have a few minutes left, and I think Bob said it is all the important stuff. So I, I'm gonna. I know you have some. You want to take some questions from from folks who tuned in. So I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> um, so we have one question from Alana. She says, uh, Dr. Fullalove mentioned the cultural apathy Americans tend to have towards prisoner populations, with the urgent needs of the correctional system right now. How do both experts see advocating to change minds, both in the public and in the government? I think Mark said it best. Uh, we're really trying to make it clear that you're not getting special treatment because you're incarcerated. You're getting special treatment because anyone who's in a position to be exposed to this virus or to expose others has to be a real priority for us. Um, this epidemic has already run out of control in New York City, and it's literally because we weren't prepared. I think everybody is supposed to use us as the object example. You don't want to have what happened in New York City happen to you. So, so the more that people are aware that this is what's going on, the more they frame this less as a criminal justice issue and more a public health issue, and the more they sound the alarm that all of us in danger are in danger, not just this particular segment of the population, perhaps th what they'll see is that it's in all of our interest to react appropriately and vigorously and not worry about, ooh, is this person worthy? Uh, should I worry about what happens if this person is somehow um, free from the problems that are created when they're exposed to this virus? I I'm hoping that that's the, that's the line that we'll take that will understand that it's not about prisoners, it's really about all of us. What he said. Um, we have a second question from Arushi. Hi, Arushi. Um, uh, she asks, uh, where do you recommend we get our information from about the current state of jails and prisons in our own hometowns and local regions? Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, most of that stuff is, should be posted. 
Um, a lot of jails maintain a, a public website in, in normal times. They have a website that has the roster of the jail. And so in a lot of places, it may be sim as simple as going to that roster, counting the number of names, and then looking on the website of the jail, what's the capacity of the jail normally? And if you know the jail has a capacity of 300 and there's only 50 names on the current roster, they're probably doing, um, they're doing pretty well. Whereas, you know, the opposite, if, if the, the capacity of the jail built was 300 and they now have 350 people. And I think you can figure that out from, um, from just looking at, and for a lot of jails is just looking at the website. Um, you could call the jail and ask. Uh, and also, I think I, I'm getting the impression that a lot of the local media have that information and they've published it. So you may just be able to Google um, your particular jail and find a reporter who's already found that information out. I really want to second the whole notion that I am addicted to Google. <laughs> if, you, if you have the correct search term, I just think you can find damn near anything. And again, because it's nice that there are some national sources. The national sources tend to look at the big headlines. If we're really looking at the small picture, as Marcus pointed out, what's happening locally, uh, then I think simply Googling information about COVID-19 jails, prisons. I, I've done that with my classes and have been overwhelmed by the amount of information that I get. Let me suggest that the real issue is actually what's the ac accuracy of what it is that you're reading. Uh, there are real lags and delays in how well things are being reported. So getting information from a variety of sources is often the one way to find what's actually going on. Because if you just rely on one source, whatever bias is present in their source may, may impact how accurate the stuff they have, uh, that they'll have for you. So the more you check around, the more, if you use multiple sources, I think then you'll really probably be in very good shape. But Google. Um, we have a question from Aruba. Is deciding the risk between a criminal justice threat and a public health threat a national issue that should have a standardized set of rules or something that you think each state should decide? Uh, this is considering that although each state has different, different criminal justice laws, coronavirus is a shared issue. Also, you're going to see real variation in the degree of crowding. I mean, part of what you want to do is a risk assessment. Not every prison is the same. In fact, I am amazed. I don't know that I've ever seen two prisons that exactly resemble each other. So what that means is what you're supposed to do is an assessment of each local area. You want to have general rules, but the general rules are do an assessment. The general rule would be do a real assessment and look at the following set of conditions, crowding, traffic, uh, comings and goings, I mean, whatever. There are standard ways in which we can tell whether or not we're in an environment that's going to be able to easily promote infection. And there are some places where we're really pretty clear this is going to not be an issue or a problem. As long as folk are following the same set of guidelines, there will be varied results because there are varied kinds of institutions that will be examined. But at least let's have a checklist that everybody heads by. And let's really be clear that when we see a threat, we're going to react to it. We're going to do something about it. I, uh, I, I agree. I'm going to say it a little bit differently, but the same thing. And Aruba, your question is very insightful. And it's a question I've been struggling with for the last couple of weeks with every, every attorney that I talk to who wants to go into court and give the court an order or a draft order that the court can issue. And I keep coming back to, I don't have that order. There is no set of rules, but as, as Bob said, there's a set of guidelines, which is look at the totality of the risk. And another principle here is that you, Bob, you kind of touched on, all, all public health is local at the end. I don't care if it's a federal institution or state institution, ultimately, and the feds can help with some rules and the, and the state can help, but ultimately it's what's happening in that community, in that county. Um, what's the public health system look like? Uh, how available are beds in the hospital in that community? How easy is it, is it to get testing in that community? Is there a homeless shelter? If it's a homeless person, then they're going out or no homeless shelter. Um, how crowded is the prison? So those are the kind of the checklists that Bob's talking about. Those are all the things you need to look at. But there is, unfortunately, there's no, there is no um, formula other than take, you have to look at the totality of the risks 
taking into account not only criminal, but also health risks to everybody. That's, this, that's the formula. Um, so it's 7.59, but we do have one more question, if you'd be able to answer. Sure. Okay. Um, from Abby, why are prisons and jails more likely to have higher rates of transmission? Is it just density or is it the lack of health care? Density and a lot of traffic in and out. <clears throat> Think about what happens in a jail. You've got a, an exchange of a population that can be a couple hundred every single day. So if you have community transition, that means people who are in the community who've been exposed are now bringing it to the prison and somebody else is getting out. So you have this back and forth, back and forth that is complicated by the crowding that's there. So it's the circulation as well as the crowding that we really worry about. Um, that, yeah. And there's a couple of other factors on top of that um, to take into consideration too. And something that I should have mentioned earlier uh, when Bob said something that triggered it, um, jails and prisons, not so much, we don't know in detention centers, that's a data free zone. We have no information, <laughs> but jails and prisons, we know that that's a higher concentration of people with, with those kinds of serious medical problems that the CDC defines. We have more asthma in prison. We more have more hepatitis C. We have more HIV um, that in prison and jail than we do in the community. So that, that creates a risk right off the bat because the population is different. A um, couple of other things, uh, food service. So in a jail or prison, um, you, you got to get fed or your food is going to come on a tray. Somebody touched the tray. How, how did they touch it? Did they wash their hands? And, you know, as much respect as I have for correct, I have a lot of respect for correctional officers. They, they have one of the toughest jobs in the country, their mortality rate from suicide, um, their PTSD levels are higher than almost any other profession in the country. So um, it's a hard job. But there's also, you know, they didn't train to be healthcare people. Um, if you give them a PPE, you give them a mask and a gown and gloves, uh, they're going to do as, about as good as I'm going to do with a shotgun. <laughs> you know, I, I can learn it. I can be trained. But coming out of the box, I'm not going to do a great job. And that's not what they went to school for. Not what, so, you know, when I, I, I hear and I see so, of some of what goes on in the prison, they're trying their hardest. But um, they don't necessarily know how to really use PPE in a proper way. And so that contributes along with um, you know, what Bob mentioned to why it's more dangerous. Even if you, t if you were to make a prison identical to a nursing home, a nursing ho the prison would still be a more dangerous place for spread of virus. All right. Okay. Um, well, thank you both for taking your time to speak with us today. We learned a lot. Um, I would ask for applause, but everyone's muted, so <laughs> that's all right. But um, thank you for showing up, everyone, and yeah, show up to our, our other events online for the rest of the semester. Thank you, guys.